We've now made it to the end of the course. Only two more topics to go. Now, both of these have something to do with employment. I really believe that employment law, studying employment law, is something that everyone should do because the fact is we are all going to be employees or employers in the future. There may be some of you who are independently wealthy, but that's unlikely. So we're going to have to experience employment. And so I thought we would begin by giving a little background on the doctrine that underlies employment. This is the legal doctrine that gave rise to the concept of employment law, and that is agency. Agency is a common law doctrine, and it says that one party can act on behalf of another. So agency is a legal relationship where one party, the agent, acts on behalf of another, who we call the principal. And of course, the most common form of agency that you will see is the employer-employee relationship. Business owners and managers depend on agents to carry out the daily operations of a business. Many businesses could not operate without agents, without employees. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the agency relationship and how it's used in business. First of all, let's talk about the creation of the agency relationship, key aspects of that relationship. Starting with consent, in order for an agent-principal relationship to exist, both the principal and the agent must agree to the relationship. There must be an agreement that the agent will act on behalf of the principal and the principal will allow the agent to act on its behalf. Control. The principal retains the right of control, the right to control the agent's actions within the scope of the agency relationship. Now, control is essential to an agent principal relationship in large part because the principal has to have the ability to control the efforts of the agent in order for the agency relationship to exist. And finally, fiduciary duty. This is a heightened duty. This is a duty wherein the agent has a legal obligation to act in the best interest of the principal, meaning the agent must put the principal's interest above their own. If I am an art collector, for instance, but I don't know a lot about art or the value of art, and so I hire an agent. I contract with an agent to go attend an auction and purchase art for me. That agent is now bound to purchase only that art which I will benefit from. If the if the agent spots a good piece and decides to buy that on their own personal account, well, then they have breached the fiduciary duty that they owed to me. Fiduciary duty means the agent has a legal obligation to act in the best interest of the principal. We'll see this fiduciary duty relevant also to corporate officers and boards of directors in which the directors or the officers owe an obligation to the company, which is greater than the obligation they owe to themselves. What makes the agency relationship so important? Well, it's really this fact. Agents have the power to bind their principles to a third party. So agents have this ability to bind their principles to a third party. Now, the principal and the agent have a relationship. So there will be a contractual relationship between the principal and the agent. The agent and the third party have a relationship. Well, because of the legal doctrine of agency, the agent has the power to bind its principal to the third party. Now, to put this in more realistic terms, think of uh, an employer-employee situation. Again, employer is always the principal. The agent, the employee, is always the agent. So, say I walk into, a, um, walk into the Gap, and I want to buy a pair of blue jeans. And I 
meet with the salesperson and I select a pair of jeans and I take the jeans to the counter and I give to the salesperson $30 and in return they hand me the jeans. The agent, the employee, and I have a relationship. The agent, the employee, and the employer have a relationship. But by acting on behalf of the employer, the employee has created a relationship between myself and the gap, the employer. So that if the genes don't work out or are faulty, it is the gap that owes the money back, not the agent themselves, not the employee who sold it to me. Similarly, I could not get a call from the gap the next day to say, look, you gave money for those jeans, but you didn't give it to the Gap. You gave it to the person at the counter. Well, again, that is not correct because now the Gap is bound by the acts of their agent. Let's talk a little bit about business and the agency relationship. It's very important in business in large part because it permits increased efficiency. Companies can delegate tasks and responsibilities to agents and allow them to focus on their core business functions. Agents can allow for expansion. Agents can represent the principal in different geographic locations or markets and thereby facilitate growth and expansion. And of course, expertise. Principals can leverage the specialized skills and knowledge of agents to achieve their business objectives. A couple of examples of agency relationships in business. The first of one we've already talked about, and that's employer-employee. Employees act as agents for their employers, carrying out tasks and making decisions on behalf of the company. Corporation and officer. Corporate officers act as agents for the corporation, making decisions and entering into contracts on its behalf. So anytime you see a corporate document, potentially you will see a signature block. And the signature block will have the name of the person who's signing the document, but it'll also have their relationship to the principal, the, do the party on behalf of whom they're signing the document. And then that principal will also be named. So it would be something like James Smith, Vice President, XYZ Corporation. And the reason that's there is it clearly identifies James Smith as an agent of the XYZ Corporation. Now, there's another area of the law where agency is important, and that has to do with a doctrine called vicarious liability. Vicarious liability refers to when the liability of an agent is passed through to the principal. Because agency law holds that a principal should be held responsible for the acts of their agent when those actions are taken on behalf of the principal. So the law treats the acts of the agent just as they would treat the acts of the principal. As long as the agent is acting within the scope of their agency relationship, then they are essentially binding the principal to any acts they take. And a principal can be held vicariously liable, meaning the liability of the agent will pass through to the principal. So as long as the agent is acting within the scope of their authority, the liability goes to the principal. Now, the agent may have liability on their own, but vicarious liability says the principal is ultimately liable. Now, we see this all the time. If you've watched TV, you've ever seen plaintiff lawyer lads, ads, we know that an employer can be liable for the wrongful acts of its employee. And this is a specialized form of vicarious liability. We call it respondeat superior. And respondeat superior applies to the employer-employee relationship within the framework of agency. So this doctrine holds the employer, the principal, 
liable for the torts, those wrongful acts, committed by the employee, who is the agent, as long as the agent is acting within the scope of their employment. Say I own a beer distributorship. I buy beer from the manufacturer and I resell it to um, retail establishments. And I have a team of drivers and trucks to deliver my beer to the retail establishments. Say that I'm very concerned about safety. And so I do everything that I can to ensure that no accidents will happen. I make sure that my drivers all have a clean driving record. I send them for training once they are hired. I have them repeat their training every six months, every year, something along those lines. I do everything I can to ensure that I have hired a very safe driver. Now, one day, one of my drivers goes out in his truck, and he runs a red light, and he strikes a vehicle, injuring the occupants inside. Now, those occupants are going to have a cause of action against the driver, right? It was the driver who ran the red light. He has his own liability. But they're also going to have a cause of action against the employer, against me, even though I did everything I could to prevent this from happening. And why is that? It's because of this legal doctrine of respondeat superior. Respondeat superior is a Latin phrase that really means let the master answer. Let the employer answer for the acts of the employee. So as long as the employee is acting within the scope of their duties, doing what it is that I hire them to do, then the liability of the employee will pass through to the employer. Now this Acting within the course and scope of employment, that is something that is litigated all the time. It often comes up if the driver was not actually delivering beer, if this driver was off duty and he broke into my yard and took a truck and went out and got into an accident, ran a red light and got into an accident, well then the driver would not be acting within the course and scope of employment and therefore no respondeat superior liability passes through to me. So agency relationship, very important for these matters of vicarious liability. So in conclusion, what did we learn today? Agency is a legal relationship where one party, the agent, acts on behalf of another, who we call the principal. We know that agency is vital to the operation of a business. A business could not operate without agents. And then finally, the doctrine of respondeat superior makes an employer liable for the torts of its employees if those acts were committed in the course and scope of employment. I hope that gives you some theoretical background to employment law and why employment law works the way it does. If you have any questions, be sure and let me know. Thanks.